Welcome guys to grade 11 life sciences. Guys today we're looking at photosynthesis but we're going to focus on some practical investigations and a quick recap we're going to be looking at is some of the basic concepts that we've already done but we also need to look at some of the key elements of what is involved in photosynthesis and the factors that influence the rate of photosynthesis. So before we get into the episode let's look at what we've done already, some, a basic overview of what we've done, recap and recollect some of the basic terminology and see how that can be applied in the context of today's lesson. So let's get straight into this. So if you guys recollect, we're looking at photosynthesis today and what we need to remember is that there are key elements of what photosynthesis is. Photosynthesis refers to the process of where light is required and it's used to synthesize energy. So we need to look at what else in addition to light is needed. So we need water, light and we need energy from the sun that collectively is used by the chlorophyll molecules to produce sugar rich energy and in that process produces carbon dioxide as a waste product. So essentially that sugar is stored converted into starch. So what we need to understand is that we need to look at what are these factors that influence the rate of starch production or glucose production and how can this be measured in terms of understanding the process of photosynthesis and the factors that influence the rate of photosynthesis. So let's recap on some of the terminology. Just an overview guys. So we've looked at photosynthesis, a very important definition that you all must know. And remember, learn the equation which will help you to define the term. We remembered that we discussed autotrophs and we refer to those organisms that are capable of manufacturing and synthesizing their own food. We also looked at heterotrophs and these are organisms that rely on the autotrophs as they are not able to manufacture their food. We looked at the chloroplast as an important organelle which has chlorophyll and that's the pigment that is responsible for the absorption of light which you're going to look at during the course of today's episode. And then we looked at carbohydrate and these, this is a complex form in which glucose is stored into the cells um, as starch granules. So we find that plants produce carbohydrates and that is in the simplest form glucose but it's eventually stored as starch in the plant. We discussed previously that photosynthesis occurs in two steps, the light reaction or the light dependent reaction as well as the light independent reaction or the dark reaction. We tend to not use the word dark reaction and we tend to rather use the word light independent reaction which is essentially the reaction that occurs independent of the source of light. And obviously the ultimate aim is to produce ATP which is the energy rich calcium molecule which is required and that, that fuels the process of photosynthesis in the light independent phase. So let's look at some of the key concepts that we've discussed and let's look at how that is integrated into today's lesson. So we discussed what an autotrophic process was. We said that there are many plants and animal like and plant like organisms that are capable of manufacturing their own food and energy from sunlight and that process is essentially photosynthesis. We know that during the process of photosynthesis the products are stored in their bodies as carbohydrates. Let's look at that equation quickly. So we know that we need carbon dioxide water and sunlight and that collectively is produced produces glucose which is C6H12O6 which is an organic compound and produces a molecule or six molecules of oxygen which is a waste product. So we need if we balance this equation off we can see that we need six carbon dioxide molecules, six water molecules to produce a single glucose molecule and six oxygen molecules. And essentially from this equation you are able to define the process of photosynthesis and it's simply saying that photosynthesis is a process that produces glucose in the presence of sunlight where water and carbon dioxide are converted and to produce the glucose where and oxygen is released as a waste product which is what we benefit from. So this is an overview of the process and the definition. Let's get straight into what we're looking at today. Again, a quick recap is it means photosynthesis is putting together energy molecules using light and plants use this light to turn water and carbon dioxide into glucose. And glucose is a type of simple sugar which we looked at. It's a monosaccharide. We know that plants use glucose as a food for energy and as a building block for growth and that glucose is used to fuel the process of respiration which is occurring in the mitochondria. 
So we definitely need the fuel, which is glucose, that fuels the respiration process in the mitochondria. And we know that autotrophs make glucose and that the heterotrophs consume all of those glucose indirectly from the producers or the autotrophs. So we refer to the autotrophs as the primary producers and that is because they are able to photosynthesize and produce energy in the form of glucose. So that's a quick overview of what we've done in terms of some of the basic concepts that we're looking at today. So let's look at phys physically today what are the factors that affect the process of photosynthesis and for us to understand that we've got to look at these elements essentially and then expand on them and look at how these can be tested in the context of an, a practical investigation. So let's look at these key concepts. So what are the factors that influence the rate of photosynthesis? Okay, so I'm going to change my highlighter. The term rate always involves time. So the rate of photosynthesis can be considered as how fast photosynthesis takes place. And often when we refer to the concept of rate, it is a process in relation to time. And hence we can measure the rate of photosynthesis in the context of how fast it occurs over a period of time. This can be measured by the amount of glucose produced by a plant over a given period of time. So guys, if we were to measure the amount of glucose as a waste as a byproduct of photosynthesis, that would indicate to us the rate of photosynthesis or how effectively photosynthesis does occur. Remember that to measure the output would be an indication of the process of photosynthesis. Remember that carbon oxygen is also produced. So we could measure the amount of oxygen that is produced as an indication of the rate of photosynthesis. This topic essentially is important to scientists and farmers. By understanding the factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis, we can do work to try and increase the rate of photosynthesis and thus increase the yield of crop. And essentially, why is it important to us to understand what are the factors that influence the rate of photosynthesis? Purely from a, from a, from a farming perspective, from an agricultural perspective, if we can understand what are the factors that influence the rate of photosynthesis, we can influence or we can manage those factors in a manner that allows us to be able to maximize and optimize the way plants grow so that the final products in terms of the fruit or the crop that is produced is of maximum. So essentially it's important for us to understand how to best um, optimize the process of photosynthesis by controlling the other variables around that influence the rate of photosynthesis. So let's look at these factors. So the three main factors that affect the rate of photosynthesis are light intensity, the temperature and carbon dioxide. And when I say the three main factors, I refer to these as primarily what is influencing the positive side of, of, the, of the reaction in terms of what are the products and what are the uh, subset molecules. So if you look at this, if we, drew the, if we wrote the equation here, all of these factors come onto the left hand side of the equation. So in, in order for us to be able to optimize the products, We've got to make sure that the, we optimize or we manipulate the reactants in a way that allows us to produce optimal product, uh, products. So cool. So what is light? Guys, if we look at light, light is essentially uh, made up of different wavelengths of, 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 of light and that we can be broken up into the different spectrum. And to understand that concept, we've, we're going to look at that in, a in another investigation, probably next week. But you've got to understand that the light that we see is made up of different wavelengths of, or different colors of light. And plants have pigments in their leaves. And based on their absorption spectrum, plants are able to absorb light of different wavelengths based on the chlorophyll that's present in the leaf. So essentially, we've got to look at how light can influence the rate of photosynthesis. The second is temperature. And knowing that temperature is, uh, is a factor that affects enzyme activity, if we recollect in grade 10, we looked at factors that influence enzyme activity. And one of those factors is temperature. And when we look at the light reaction and the light independent reaction, both of these reactions involve enzymes that are all influenced by temperature. And hence, if we have the ideal temperature, if we have the optimum temperature, we can optimize the rate of glucose production or the process of photosynthesis. So we can look at how temperature can be influenced or can influence the rate of uh, photosynthesis. And finally, we have the, the, the fuel, the building blocks of photosynthesis, which is carbon dioxide. And we know that carbon dioxide and water both are needed for photosynthesis. However, if we can optimize the level of carbon dioxide in a greenhouse, we can optimize the rate of photosynthesis.
We've got to remember that there are other factors, but we will look at those factors and how we can control them to optimize the rate of photosynthesis. So below, I've illustrated three graphs that actually illustrate the trends that would occur when we manipulate each of those three variables that we've just discussed. So let's look at this. Let's look at light intensity. What does this graph illustrate? So it shows you a, a, a relationship where initially there's a gradual increase and after a little, after a point, there's a constant level at which the rate of photosynthesis becomes optimal or becomes constant. So we say that if we were to interpret the understanding around the, the two variables here where we've got light intensity on the x-axis and the rate of photosynthesis on the y-axis, which could be measured in terms of the amount of glucose or even the amount of oxygen bubbles that are produced. And here we see that as the light intensity initially increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases, but that stops at a specific point, after which any further increase in the light intensity means that the rate of photosynthesis remains almost constant. So that's quite uh, a significant relationship to, to remember. Let's look at the next relationship, the amount of carbon dioxide and how that influences. Initially, again, we see that the rate of carbon dioxide as the amount of carbon dioxide increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. But we get to a specific point where any further increase in the, rate, in the amount of carbon dioxide does not influence the amount of or the rate of photosynthesis. And hence we say that this, at this point, this is the optimal concentration of carbon dioxide which optimizes the rate of photosynthesis. So essentially, if a farmer is planting uh, commercial crop and he's trying to optimize his production of food and if he gives if he saturates his greenhouse with carbon dioxide they needs he needs to understand at what point is the carbon dioxide that he's providing to the plants optimal and hence it might be an expensive economically expensive process to provide too much of carbon dioxide so ideally what we're looking at is providing the uh, the best the optimal amount of carbon dioxide so that the rate of photosynthesis can be optimal without having to compromise the, the investment of too much of funds into providing too much of oxy, carbon dioxide. And finally, as I discussed, the last factor is temperature. And when we look at temperature, guys, we can see quite a, 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 gra a similar graph to when we looked at enzyme activity. Here we see that as temperature increases, the rate of photosynthesis increases. However, it reaches an optimal point, after which any further increase in temperature causes a decrease in the rate of photosynthesis and hence what we understand by this is that all plants have an optimum temperature at which they function and that optimum temperature means that the rate of photosynthesis at that specific point is maximum however any further increase in the temperature will cause the rate of photosynthesis to decrease and that's essentially because as I said earlier on enzymes enzymes are what is controlling the rate of uh, or the controlling the reactions and hence if we were to increase the temperature beyond the optimal, it will cause the denaturing of those enzymes and hence it will render the process of photosynthesis uh, incomplete and hence it will cause a decrease in the production of the products or even the rate of photosynthesis. And hence a farmer who is planting, planting commercial crop will need to identify what is the optimal temperature at which those specific crops grow and he would need to set up a temperature so that in a greenhouse he can optimize the rate of photosynthesis and the production of byproducts. So cool guys, we've looked at, essentially we've looked at the factors that influence the rate of reactions in photosynthesis. Let's look at some experiments now. We're going to look at these in great detail. I'm going to give you guys a short break, um, freshen up and when we get back we're going to look at an investigation and see how these factors manipulated can influence the rate of photosynthesis. So let's have a short break and we'll get back after that. Welcome back guys, I hope you guys refreshed. Let's get straight into this investigation. So an investigation was set up to determine some factors that influence the rate of photosynthesis. Let's read through this. Study the following ex experiment. Investigating the rate of photosynthesis. So here we're looking at how the rate of photosynthesis is affected. Let's look at the aim. Very important for us to understand. What is this experiment all about? Here it is to use pondweed to see how light intensity affects the rate of photosynthesis. And guys, this is quite important. Why do we use pondweed or why do we use aquatic plants? And often you'd see that if you go and look at a, a pond or if you look at an aquatic 
uh, sort of a, a lake, a river, if you look closely at some of those plants, you often see bubbles coming up. And we can look at that, those bubbles, as an indication of the rate of photosynthesis. So if you do spend some time looking at, sometimes you find uh, algae or moss, or uh, algae growing in ponds, stay into the ponds and you'll notice that there are bubbles that often rise up. And those bubbles are actually the gas that is produced by photosynthesis. And if you guess right, guys, remember that oxygen is produced. So those bubbles will be an indication of photosynthesis occurring. And hence, we can manipulate variables and look at the production of bubbles as an indication of the rate of photosynthesis. Over and apart, we can also look at the presence of starch, which we will look at, at in some other investigation. So let's look at the method, method and what was set up. So this is a setup of the apparatus shown in the diagram. Let's look at this very quickly. Here we've got uh, a pond weed and it's a aquatic plant. It's kept in a beaker and here you see that it's kept in a nice beaker, a transparent beaker. Uh, and you see some bubbles being produced and those bubbles are obviously rising to the surface. And, uh, and essentially what we're saying is that how fast or how many of those bubbles come up to the surface is an indication of the rate of photosynthesis. And we, here we find that a little away from the beaker in which the pond weed is placed or immersed, we find that there is a desk lamp, which is our light source. And this desk lamp is a constant supply of light, which is influencing the rate of photosynthesis. And what is done in this experiment is that we've got a calibrated ruler at which the light is kept at a specific distance. And this ruler is, and this light source is gently moved over regular intervals and the rate of photosynthesis is measured by counting the number of bubbles. So here we're seeing that the, we move the lamp away by 10 centimeters intervals up to 50 centimeters. And what is essentially happening is that we, we're decreasing the light intensity and we're looking at the bubble production. So let's read through this. So the method was we leave, uh, we leave for five minutes for the pond weed to acclimatize to the new light intensity. So this is a very important word, acclimatization. And essentially, when you do set up an experiment, guys, often we need to let this, weed, this pond weed acclimatize to the different temperature, the different light intensity, before we influence the experiment by changing the light intensity. So this pond weed was left in the beaker to acclimatize for five minutes so that it would not influence our results in a negative manner. Count the number of bubbles given off in one minute. So these bubbles were counted in regular intervals, intervals of one minute and that was then recorded in a table. We then moved the light 10 centimeters further back. We left it for five minutes again to acclimatize, and then we counted the number of bubbles given off in one minute at a distance of 10 centimeters. We repeated this by moving the lamp away by a further 10 centimeter in intervals up till 50 centimeters were reached, and that was then, and that those values were then recorded. So let's look at some of the values that we recorded. Here we're seeing some of the results that we obtained, and that is tabulated in a nice table. Here we're seeing the distance of the lamp to the beaker and the number of bubbles given off. So here we changed the distance, and that was in centimeters, and that was regularly changed from 10, 20, 30, 50, 40, and 50. So as, we, as this increased away from the pond weed, we looked at and we counted the number of bubbles that we produced Per minute and that is very that's very important to remember so this is an illustration that represents the number of bubbles per minute and what you look at it here when it was 10 centimeters away it produced 15 bubbles at 20 it produced 7 at 30 it produced 3 at 40 centimeters away it produced 1 and at 50 centimeters away it produced 0 so essentially what we're seeing here is that we're seeing that as the distance away from the light increased the number of bubbles produced gradually decrease. So that's something very important to understand. Here we're seeing a relationship. We're seeing a relationship between the light intensity decreasing, moving away, and the photosynthesis, the rate of photosynthesis decreasing. Quite a, quite a good illustration to represent graphically, which I will do in a little while. So let's look at some of the questions that, um, that we need to answer in this, in this experiment. Write down a suitable hypothesis for the above experiment. So guys, the important word is hypothesis here. And I'll spend some time unpacking what the word hypothesis means. We are familiar with the term aim. And aim refers to the question, uh, it's, the, it's the question that you'd ask yourself, what are you doing in this experiment? What do you plan to prove? And that would be the aim. So the aim is essentially 
what is the objective of conducting such an investigation? And here we clearly remember that it was to determine the effect of light intensities on the rate of photosynthesis. However, when we refer to the word hypothesis, the hypothesis is often I ask my learners to remember what is it? Is it an educated guess? Yes. What is the prediction that you're making without having to say I predict? And that's very important. So the hypothesis, what do you think will happen in this investigation? However, in this investigation, we are presented with values from the observations. Let's look at those values to, to formulate a hypothesis. I'm going to skip back to the, my previous slide. And when we look at this, guys, we're seeing a relationship here where the distance of the lamp increases and the number of bubbles per minute decreases. So essentially what we're saying here is that there's a relationship between as the distance of the lamp increases from the beaker, the number of bubbles decrease, which is a, rate, a decrease in the rate of photosynthesis. So if we were to formulate a hypothesis, it is very important to remember that it needs to include both the independent and the dependent variables in dependent variables in your hypothesis. So you need to have both the independent and the dependent variables in that. So essentially what would we formulate as a hypothesis? So as the distance from the lamp increases, the rate of photosynthesis decreases or you could say that the number of bubbles decrease. Again, if, we, if I was marking this in a test, I'll be looking for what is the independent variable here, which is essentially we looked at the independent variable here, it is the lamp, the distance of the lamp from the light source and the dependent variable would be the number of bubbles produced which would be the dependent variable. So essentially a question like this would appear for two to three marks and it's a statement, it is not an investigative question and hence you are more than likely to get two marks if you said that. 1.2, identify the following variables. So guys, remember that when we look at any investigation, these are marks for jam. When I say that marks for jam, these are often questions that would come when you have an experimental design question. So we often need to refer to what are the independent variables, what are the dependent variables, and what are the control variables. So essentially this question talks about what is the independent variable. And often I find that there's a confusion around what is the dependent variable and what is the independent variable. And we get learners often saying, well, it's whatever you manipulated in the experiment, but that's often a nice question to ask, but it can get tricky when, when there's many variables that are manipulated. So what I often help my learners do is that I ask them, what are you testing in this experiment? So ask yourself the question, what have you tested in this experiment? And often what you've tested in this experiment would be the indication of the independent variable versus the question for what is the dependent variable? And that is, what have you measured in this experiment that gives you an answer where you can draw a conclusion. I'll repeat that. So the dependent variable is often what have you measured during your observations that help you draw a conclusion. And that often, if you can identify that, that often is the dependent variable. So in this experiment, we've looked at manipulating two variables. We've looked at the independent and dependent variable. So let's look at the independent variable. It's the light intensity or the distance of the lamp from the beaker. So we can refer to that as the light intensity, which is the amount of light, which is, in, which is basically controlled by moving the plant away from, or moving the light source away from the plant. So it could also be the distance of the light source from the plant. So we can say the light intensity, which is indirectly the distance that we've manipulated. The next question would be, identify the dependent variable. And guys, I said, ask yourself the question, what have you measured in this experiment that helps you draw conclusions or make observations? So essentially what we're looking at in this experiment is, we said that if we counted the number of bubbles or the number of oxygen bubbles given off, that would indicate to us the rate of photosynthesis. So it's the number of bubbles or the amount of oxygen produced, which is measured by the number of bubbles. We also have the third variable, which we often must remember, the controlled variable. Now, in order for, us, our, in order for our experiment to be accurate, to be fair, and to, be, to produce reliable results, we need to make sure that we control those variables, that, the other variables that could influence the results. In this experiment, we've looked at several variables that had to be controlled 
to ensure that it was only the independent variable, in this case the distance of the light uh, from the plant that influences the results. We know that there are several other factors that can, can influence the rate of the results, however we have tried to keep those controlled. And essentially these are the variables that need to be controlled. So let's look at them. So we need to control the size of the pondweed because we know that if we change the size of the pondweed, if we use a larger twig or a smaller twig, that could produce either more bubbles or less. The volume of water, because we know that water is essential for the process of photosynthesis, and hence we could change the volume of the water, which could affect the rate of photosynthesis, as well as temperature. If we were to influence the reaction by changing the temperature at regular intervals, we would have a very different set of results. And hence we need to control the size of the weed, the volume of water in which was present in that beaker, as well as the temperature. And often, guys, this experiment is a there's a fine line between light intensity and temperature. And as if you if you would recollect, if you put your hand near a light source, you do feel heat. However, that heat decreases, changes as you move the light source away from your hand. And hence, essentially, it could be a combination of both the light intensity and heat or temperature in this experiment. However, we've maintained the temperature in the context of that environment constant when the distance was changed. Cool. Hope you guys are following. So let's identify the gas that is containing, uh, contained in those bubbles. So guys, if you remember, what are the products of photosynthesis? We've got glucose and we've got oxygen. So essentially what we would be looking at is that gas would be oxygen. And we can do experiments to test that, which we will discuss in a little while. Write down a suitable conclusion for the above experiment. And guys, often when you have an experiment like this, where there is a set of data that is provided, you need to look at that data to help you synthesize a conclusion. And essentially what it is, is what has happened in this experiment? What can you draw from this experiment? And essentially what we're saying as a conclusion for this would be, more oxygen bubbles are produced when the light source is closer to the beaker. So in other words, the greater the light intensity, the greater the rate of photosynthesis. And that's a factor that influences photosynthesis up to a level as we had seen in those graphs early on. 1.5. Draw a simple sketch graph to illustrate the results of this experiment. And guys, here's a question that often comes for between four to six marks and it's a simple sketch graph. So what do we mean by sketch graph? What we mean is that this would be plotted on a blank piece of paper, not on a graph sheet, but the key elements of any graph would essentially need to be there. So here we're looking at a graph that needs to be plotted that sketches the results of this experiment. So what do we have on the independent axis? We have the x variable and that and the on the x-axis we have the independent variable which would be the distance of the lamp from the beaker and that is in the units centimeters. We also need to plot the dependent variable on the y-axis and in this case it is the number of bubbles and that is produced per minute. Cool. Let's generate a very simple scale on the x-axis. Remember that it started at 0, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 centimeters and what we saw that the number of bubbles we're going to count them in units of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 and from the from that table guys we can see that as the distance of the lamp from the light source decreased the number of bubbles decreased so we the trend the trend line would be something like this so here you're going to be getting marks for the trend line you're going to get marks for both the x and y axis labeled with units as well as we've got to give this graph a heading and the heading needs to describe both the dependent variable and the independent variable and essentially what we're saying is that it's a graph that shows the relation ship between the distance of light source and the number of bubbles produced. So for that 
you're going to get the other mark. So you need to have a heading, you need to have your X and Y axes labeled, and you need to show the trend line. And in this case, it is that trend line that shows that as the distance increased, the rate of photosynthesis decreased. So guys, we've done this experiment, and I think you guys have had a good idea of how light intensity can influence the rate of reaction. So I'm going to go into a short break, and when we get back, we're going to look at a few other investigations to see how other factors influence the rate of a reaction. So a short, quick break, and see you on the flip side of that. Welcome back, guys. I hope you had a good break. Let's get into some more investigations to look at how these factors influence the rate of photosynthesis. Another activity. Study the following experiment, which was conducted to determine if carbon dioxide is needed for photosynthesis. And as, as I said earlier on, we know that temperature influences the rate of reaction. Light intensity influences the rate of reaction. Now we're looking at the third factor, which is the amount of carbon dioxide. So let's read the method and see how this method was conducted. Select two de-starched potted plants, cover both plants with bell jars and label them as A and B. Inside bell jar A, place a beaker of sodium bicarbonate solution and sodium bicarbonate is used to produce carbon dioxide and that's something that we must remember, it's very important. Inside bell jar B, we place a beaker of sodium hydroxide solution, NaOH, and the function of NaOH is to absorb carbon dioxide. Here we have a source of carbon dioxide and here we have sodium hydroxide which removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We seal both bell jars using a rubber bung with two glass tubes that allow air to enter and to leave the bell jars. I'm going to illustrate that for you very quickly. Bell jar B allows the air coming in to pass over the soda lime. And guys, if you remember, soda lime can be used to test for the presence of CO2. And in this case, it turns milky white. And if it does turn milky white, it means that carbon dioxide has been present to influence soda lime to becoming milky white. We've got to keep both the bell jars in sunlight for at least six hours. Perform the starch test on one leaf taken from each plant. So guys below here I'm going to talk you through this experiment and essentially illustrate to you exactly what was done. So when we look at any experiment guys it's always important for us to remember that we often need a control. And this experiment, we're seeing that there's a control. There's two sets that are set up. Here we've got a bell jar, and that's essentially uh, a bell-shaped jar that's, that's placed over two potted plants which have been de-starched. And what's very important for us to remember is de-starch is something that we need to talk about in detail. To each, in each beaker, here we've got beaker A, or bell jar A, and bell jar B. And bell jar A has got an inlet that has, supplies it with air, and a an, and, and pipe that supplies it with removing the air, an outlet pipe. We've got a de-starch pot in there, a potted plant in there with sodium uh, NaHCO3, sodium hydro, uh, hydroxide, sodium carbonate, sorry, sodium carbonate. And that's if you recollect sodium carbonate, guys, from the instructions or the, from the sodium carbonate is a source that produces carbon dioxide. So here we've got carbon dioxide that's being released by this chemical to the plant and we have air that enters which contains carbon dioxide. We have a light source that is similar and that is available to both and these were kept in sunlight for six hours. Let's look at Belgia B. Belgia B contains a de-starch plant and it has sodium hydroxide solution, so NaOH solution and if we recollect from the method sodium hydroxide solution absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. So here we are removing the carbon dioxide from the air that enters. So remove CO2 and here we've got air coming in and here you've got soda lime here. And guys soda lime is remember it's used to test for the presence of CO2 coming in and soda lime does turn milky white in the presence of carbon dioxide. What is important is that we need to remember is that both of these jars are sealed in the bottom with a, ru with a rubber bung and that's to prevent any air from the atmosphere entering. We've got a rubber stopper on the ends 
uh, on the upper ends as well and hence this is a sealed unit in which no other gas from the external surface or the external atmosphere can enter into these closed contained environments <coughs> excuse me let's look at what happened so the following observations were recorded and that's very important for us to see what happened leaf A from plant in Belgia A in which sodium bicarbonate was kept gave a positive test for starch so here we have a positive test for starch so that means starch was present what did it contain let's go back to this so it contained sodium hydroxide sodium bicarbonate sorry and it had de starch plant and when when this leaves when these leaves were tested it tested positive for starch and we'll talk about that starch test in a little while and leaf from plant B in Belgium B in which sodium hydroxide was given tested negative so here we find that that because the carbon dioxide was removed there was no glucose or no starch present so guys if we talk of the starch test what is the starch test and if you guys remember from grade 10 we did the test for different organic compounds so I'm just gonna go back there to test for different organic compounds we use certain reagents and if you recollect for using for to test for starch we used iodine and iodine is is yellowish brown in color in the presence of starch it turns to a dark blue or a violet or a black color with some precipitate so when starch is present iodine from yellow turns blue black so that is essentially the starch test which is done and that's done on the leaves after they've been subjected to six hours in sunlight so let's get to some of these questions let's look at what the first question is so we've got to answer the following questions and see what these answers are let's look at them so explain why two plants are destarched and how this is done before the experiment so guys remember that destarching is a process of removing the starch from the plants and why is this done we keep them in a dark cupboard so that whatever starch has been produced already in them is utilized for respiration and that the existing starch in the leaves do not influence the results after six hours so and hence when these plants are de-starched they're kept in a dark room for a little for, for a few days probably a week or two until whatever starch is present in those leaves have been utilized for respiration and that essentially gives us a very controlled atmosphere to be able to understand exactly where the starch has been produced or if it's started has already been in the leaf so to remove the starch that already is present in the leaves so that when we test for starch at the end of the experiment it will not be an indication of starch produced during the experiment it will only be an indication of start starch produced during the experiment this is done by placing the plants in a dark room or cupboard for a few days during which process during the process during that process sorry the starch is utilized for respiration by the mitochondria the next question write down a suitable conclusion for the experiment after studying the observations so when we looked at those observations we looked at Belja A and Belja B and we compared the results so let's see what is the comparison that we need to draw so when you looked at plant in Belja A we noticed that there was this tested positive so we're saying that plant in Belja A gets carbon dioxide and when it does receive the carbon dioxide it produces starch whereas plant in Belja B gets no carbon dioxide it means that it does not produce starch so let's read this answer plant in Belja A gets carbon dioxide whereas plants in Belja B do not get carbon dioxide this simply means that CO2 must be needed or it is necessary for photosynthesis essentially what we've talked about in this experiment is proving that carbon dioxide is necessary for photosynthesis and that can be done using the starch, starch test in which de-starch leaves are tested after being subjected to six or seven hours of photosynthesis and that is essentially how we have proved that photosynthesis does require carbon dioxide so guys we're looking at the next question and this question is an activity that talks about how plants um, utilize how a single plant can be utilized to test for different factors study the diagram below 
and answer the questions that follow. So let's look at this diagram. It does, it does talk about several different leaves subjected to different tests. So here we've got a bell jar again, also sealed air with an airtight rubber at the bottom. Here we've got leaf A inside the bell jar. We've got leaf B on the outside with a black a strip covered over it. And we've got leaf C, which is also on the external surface. The opening of the bell jar is sealed with a rubber stopper to prevent the entry of any gas into or leaving. And we have potassium hydroxide solution here. And that potassium hydroxide solution there is to provide, again, the leaf with, a, with, with we'll talk about that with carbon dioxide. And what is very interesting is that if you look very carefully around the base of the pot, we see a little plastic bag which is wrapped and sealed tight around the pot plant. Quite interesting to note that here we, we've got some mechanism that is controlling an external factor that could influence the rate of photosynthesis. So here we have a single plant that is being tested for various factors at the same time. So let's look at some of these questions based on this and let's try and understand the thinking behind this experiment. So when we look at that plant, I'm going to ask you these questions and then possibly give you a chance to have a discussion for a bit before we solve these. Okay, so 3.1. Why was the plant kept in a dark room for 24 hours before being placed in sunlight? Question number 3.2. What is the aim of the experiment on leaf A? So guys, two simple questions that I'm going to give you a chance to work through. Maybe let's look at the third one as well. What is the function of potassium hydroxide in this experiment? So guys, I'll give you a minute to have a look at these. And then when we get back after a minute, we will have a quick discussion to solve some of these. So let's look at this and remember these questions, guys. A minute for you to solve through these. So welcome back guys, hope you had a good discussion. Let's look at these answers and see what have you come up with. Okay, so cool. So the first question was, why was the plant kept in a dark room for 24 hours before being placed in sunlight? And that was simple guys. And this was to destarch the plant and this was to stop so that no, no photosynthesis can occur and that any existing starch would be utilized and no new starch produced. So essentially what we're saying is that we're stopping the process of photosynthesis, we're allowing the plant to de-starch by utilizing whatever storage, stored starch is present so that when we test for the factors that influence the, fa the rate of photosynthesis, we're only testing for the pre those factors and not factors that have already influenced starch production. The second question, what is the aim of the experiment? And that's quite simple. The aim of this experiment was to investigate if carbon dioxide is needed for photosynthesis. And if you look back at those diagrams, we saw that we removed, if you look at this diagram, we, we removed all the external elements and we have provided potassium hydroxide KOH solution here, which would provide a source of carbon dioxide to those leaves for photosynthesis to occur. So cool. Let's look at the third question. What is the function of potassium hydroxide? And exactly, guys, we've just answered that. So it's there to absorb carbon dioxide and as a source of, as to make sure that whatever is occurring is because of the process of photosynthesis lacking in carbon dioxide. Cool. Let's get on to the next question. 
why is a clay pot enclosed in a plastic bag? And that's quite interesting. If you recollect, we said that around the clay pot, we looked at the pot at the base being enclosed with a plastic bag. And that pot is enclosed with a plastic bag to prevent some of the carbon dioxide that is produced by the microorganisms that undergo respiration from affecting the rate of photosynthesis. So to prevent carbon dioxide, which is, which is produced by the microorganisms in the soil from being released into the glass belger, which would ultimately affect the rate or influence the rate of photosynthesis. I think we've got time for a few more. 3.5. Why is it important to have an airtight seal at the base of the bell jar? Quite an interesting question, but we often need to make sure that we, we're controlling all possible variables that could affect the rate of the reaction. And in this case, we know that if there's carbon dioxide that comes from the external source or from the atmosphere, that will definitely influence the rate of the reaction. So this is to prevent the entry of air into the bell jar. It's to prevent any air from the external atmosphere from entering and this will eventually affect the accuracy of your results. Okay. 3.6. Which leaf is the control leaf and why is it necessary to have a control? And guys, if you do go back to that question, you will notice that the leaf that we're talking about that is a control in this case is leaf C. And leaf C is a control because it provides a frame of reference to compare with and to show that the effect is without the independent variable. And if you look at that diagram, remember that C was the leaf that was present outside. And here we've allowed this leaf to photosynthesize with carbon dioxide, whereas in this we've taken out, we've put in sodium hydroxide which removes carbon dioxide from the plant and hence these leaves will not photosynthesize. Okay, time for one last question before we close for the session. Let me go back. Okay, so 3.7. What is the aim of this investigation? And guys, it was quite simple, and it was there to determine the effect that effect of light on photosynthesis and how carbon dioxide can be. Oh, so sorry, let me read this question again. What is the aim of the investigation on leaf B? And that is the leaf that is covered with, if we go back to that, this is leaf B, guys, and it's got some area covered with black paper. And that's essentially to show that if we cover this area with black paper and we compare that to the areas that are exposed, we can see and we can compare that to areas that have not photosynthesized. One last question, guys, before we close up for today. And the last question is, name the substance that is used to test for um, starch in the leaves and describe the positive test. This is something that we've just done before we got into this. And the substance that we use is iodine. And iodine is yellowish in color and it'll turn bluish black in the presence of starch. So that would be a positive test. So guys, I hope you've enjoyed this session. We've come to the end of it. We've looked at some of the key factors that influence the effects of photosynthesis in a practical investigation. Take care, enjoy, work smart. <laughs>